everyone. I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inform at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual conversation with Dr. Ibram X. Kendi and Alexis Madrigal. This program is generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are incredibly grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but to make sure we're keeping the public informed during this coronavirus outbreak, we are going full speed ahead with a full slate of live online programs. These conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you please consider donating to help us continue our work. You can visit commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 during this program. Now, please welcome Dr. Ibram X. Kendi and Alexis Magical to Inforum. Hey, hello, and welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, I am Alexis Madrigal. I'm a journalist at The Atlantic, uh, and I've been running the COVID tracking project, which aims to collect and track the most comprehensive data available on COVID-19 for U.S. states and territories. Um, and I'm extremely pleased to be in conversation here with Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Um, he's the New York Times bestselling author. I think he actually, he won the National Book Award, yeah, Emma's. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's a historian and uh, leading uh, anti-racist voice. Um, he's the executive director of American University's Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. And we actually, um, we both write for The Atlantic, and we've actually partnered um, to create something called the COVID Racial Data Tracker, which is an attempt to uh, assemble and publish the data on racial disparities um, of the pandemic across the United States. Um, if you'd like to ask either of us a question, please ask it uh, in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or uh, if you're watching on Facebook, ask it in the comments. Um, so let's get started. Thanks for uh, joining us, Dr. Kendi. Of course, yeah, always great to be in conversation with you. Why don't, yeah, why don't we, um, let's talk about your, your first pieces on this because I think they do really help um, set the stage. Um, so you're watching, like all of us, you're, you're watching COVID-19 spread across the country um, in late March, and you start to wonder and think about the ways that disasters, well, disastrous, uh, have not hit every community uh, equally. And you end up writing kind of a, a series of essays. So what was your kind of thought process moving into, uh, the, into April? Well, I mean, I, I think first and foremost, I think what April 1st, I think maybe only one state had been had already released racial demographic data and I think on cases. Uh, I think that was Illinois. Um, and and so when I started writing this piece, I only saw Illinois and 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 there was a disparity. Um, and and so I started thinking, well, why aren't other states releasing this demographic? racial demographic data and, and what can we find uh, if, if states are. And, and I also knew as, as, as a student of, of racial disparities that there are a series of racial uh, health disparities. And, and so I started seeing like other Americans that, that people who have heart disease or specifically hypertension, people who have diabetes, people who have obesity were, were more likely to, to die of COVID-19. And I also knew that black people in, in particular are more likely to have hypertension than, than let's say white people, black people are also more likely to have diabetes and, and obesity rates are higher. So, so I was just wondering, first and foremost, what the racial demographic breakdown of deaths and, and even um, infections are. And then um, I was also, wondering why haven't states released this, released this data, especially as you know, since we all know that there are these racial health disparities. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I started writing pieces calling for that data. Um, fortunately, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and Senator Elizabeth Warren also around that same time were started calling for, for racial demographic data and were able to get some of their colleagues uh, to do so as well. What do we know about what generates uh, health disparities? I mean, just for people who haven't been, you know, who are, who are kind of new to like, oh, wow, these health disparities are, are enormous. Um, what do we know about what generates those? Oh, man, where, where can we even begin, Alexa? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, you, I think most Americans understand that 
if you if you live in a neighborhood that's polluted, then that pollution is going to lead to people getting more likely to get asthma, or more likely to get certain levels of certain types of cancers, you know, and other diseases. Well, it just so happens that that particularly Black communities are, are more likely, and even poor communities and Latinx communities are more likely to, their communities are more likely to be polluted. They're, they're more likely to, to, to be near um, polluting stations, whether that's a corporate waste dump or whether that's a, you know, a transfer station um, or whatever. We, we also know that if you are less likely as Latinx and Black people are to have health insurance, then you're less likely to receive preventative care. And thereby you're less likely to find out that you had cancer at stage one. You're more likely to find out you had it at stage four and thereby you're more likely to die. Um, we also know that black people uh, and Latinx people are more likely to live in food deserts. And, and we've shown relationships between the food that we eat and diseases and, and, the, and the level of health that we have. We also know that there that they're Black and Latinx people are more likely to live in what's called trauma deserts, uh, and Native people are more likely to live in trauma deserts, meaning they don't, there aren't trauma one centers there, meaning when you have a life-threatening event happens to you, you're less likely to see that, that high-level trauma care. You know, we can go sort of yeah. on and on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can give a little bit of the local perspective, too. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the people that I have just tremendous respect for here in the Bay Area is a guy named Tony Eiten. Um, he's, uh, he's one of these people, you know, he's a, he's a lawyer, he's a JD, MD, MPH, you know, which is a wow. lot of letters. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and one of the things that he did is he was the county health officer for Alameda County, which is where, which is where Oakland is. Mm -hmm. um, and he was seeing, you know, he knew from his experience as a doctor that, you know, different areas of the city had different, uh, he, he just saw people dying earlier um, mm -hmm. in, in poor communities and black communities and Latin communities. And he was wanted to, a, a way to, to quantify that and to show what that, what that was. It was another kind of data hole. There were just wasn't yeah. this data that you could just say, well, people here live for this long and people there live for that long. And so um, he actually in Alameda County pioneered a method to basically calculate life expectancy at very like uh, sort of high spatial resolution, which is to say either at the census tract or even smaller than that. Um, and what that showed first in Alameda County, but then eventually they extended the, um, this method of analysis all across the, the country was that, you know, uh, for people who are familiar with the Bay geography, which I assume a lot of people are here at, um, uh, at Commonwealth Club, that, you know, people up in the hills, um, whether they were white or black, um, lived substantially longer than people who lived in the flatlands. And if you were a white person living in the hills versus a black person or a Mexican person living in the flatlands, you lived a lot longer. Um, and it was the, the kind of the difference in life expectancy between people up in the hills and people down um, in the flatlands is equivalent to like a Nordic country to um, you know, some of the poorest places on earth. And so you really had that within a city and um, I think it's something that people really, really don't actually understand that the health disparities we're talking about are not caused by, you know, gun violence. They're not caused by a bunch of these things that people think, oh yeah, that, that must be it. It's actually people are dying of the same things up in the hills and in the flatlands. They're just dying a lot earlier uh, in the flatlands. And um, I thought, you know, the second I read your, your piece on April 1st and started thinking about this, I was like, oh wow, this, this wave of disease that's sweeping the country is gonna find some strongholds that it doesn't really get into. And then it's gonna find all these other areas, all these, all these lowlands that it is just gonna wipe out. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and you know, to also speak to more, I remember when uh, Congressman Cummings passed away, he actually wrote an essay for the Atlantic that sort of made the case that one of the greatest white privileges is life itself, precisely because of this reason. And and I actually pulled up the essay, and I remember I actually wrote about how, for instance, in, in Cummings' home, in, in um, home of Baltimore, a white baby born in this neighborhood called Chesswood can expect to live until 87 years 
oh, nine miles away in Clifton Barrier where the wire was filmed, a black baby can only expect to live 67 years. So nine mile difference, you have a 20 year, uh, and the same, thing, the same thing is the case in places like Chicago or, and, and Kansas City and others. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, I mean, the people have even developed a way of, of talking about that that they call weathering um, because it's, yeah. you know, it, it's difficult to describe what exactly, you know, to pin it down. Is it, is it the pollution? Is it like the, the undertow of socioeconomic uh, circumstance? Is it just like straight up just racism just gets people, you know, and they're, um, you know, I, I always found that just such a tragic, but also like evocative way of thinking about it that, you know, you've just got the elements are just pressing on people and sooner or later they, they're going to give and it's sooner um, uh, for people of color and in particular um, in the US for, for black people in a lot of cases. Um, what's, what's different about COVID then? Is, is there anything different about uh, COVID in the way that it's going to hit, you know, hit against these structures that we know exist? I think that the only thing it seems to me is different about COVID is, is that we are, we are talking about, or at least people are potentially beginning to recognize what I've been trying to call the racial pandemic within this larger viral pandemic. And so there's a recognition, at least, of these massive, particularly death disparities, and certainly even infection um, rates as well. And, and I think people are recognizing that. And, and for those of us who see that as a problem, there's, you know, recognizing that as a problem. And the reason why I mention that is because there's disparities in heart disease and cancer. And this is a regular everyday thing in which, you know, if you're Black, there's more Black people uh, disproportionately dying of these, of, 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 of cancer and heart disease, which is the number one and two killer um, of Americans every single day. And it's just normal. <laughs> it's just normal. Mm -hmm. And we're not thinking about, or at least at a national level, we're not thinking about why these disparities exist. And, mm -hmm. and so hopefully this, this conversation about the disparities around COVID will then fold into a larger conversation about health disparities in general, the ones that we've normalized, because mm -hmm. none of these things should be considered normal. That's such a good point. You know, I, I um, think one, one, one answer I have to this question of like, what's different about COVID yeah. um, kind of sends me back to the kind of late 19th century. Um, you know, you had the American cities, you know, the, the industrial American city is really forming. Um, and you have a series of disasters. You know, there's a person I always mention in the context of this, a guy named Richard White, who's a historian down at Stanford. And, you know, one time I called him up, I was like, you know, why doesn't infrastructure get built anymore, you know? And he's like, well, how did infrastructure get built in the past? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, basically it's disasters. It's like calamity. Like he, wow. his, his basic the causality for creating sort of American city as we have known it with trash collection, granted, uneven trash collection, with, with water systems, though, with fire, with all of the sort of um, components of like a, a, of a modern city infrastructure. Um, basically, his answer is that at first people tried to build systems that only, that only helped rich people and, and obviously white people or, you know, uh, at that period of time, it was really like uh, native born because, you know, there'd been this huge influx of immigration from Southern Europe. Um, and, and Eastern Europe. And so they tried to build just, you know, protection just for the, the, those strongholds, the, the native strongholds, but it didn't work because fundamentally fires and infectious disease cannot be controlled in that way. And so my only hope for this is not that like people will suddenly become less racist, or as you say, these health disparities have been persistent for so long and People have brought all the data to show that these things exist, that it's not about like individual people taking responsibility, that it is in fact structural problems of the American system that lead to these outcomes, that people are being killed, um, you know, 10 and 15 years before, not because of their own behavior, but because of the, the world around them and the structures that we've set up and the policies that exist. And in this case, if we try to do that again, like people are seeing at these meatpacking plants with a bunch of like undocumented and like Latin workers there 
who they were forcing to go into the office. It was already a dangerous occupation. Uh, and by office, I mean the plant, forcing them to go on the plant. And now there's huge outbreaks in all the towns where there were meatpacking plants, and not just among the workers and not just among uh, you know, the Latins who were working there, but among everybody, because that's how infectious disease works. And so there is like this opportunity, I think, to show people how these disparities do hurt us all, um, whether you're Mexican, whether you're black, like that, that these, this American society has to deal with this um, as a whole. So, I mean, that's probably too hopeful to be honest, but, um, but at least there's a chance, you know? And I guess, do you, do you think that alongside the hope for that, the, the, the sort of rebuilding of, of those structures and infrastructure more, more broadly, that there will become also an American hunger for a different way of collecting and understanding data oh, <laughs> in and of itself. Because I think on, on some level, many Americans are realizing just how critical data collection and analysis is in fighting this pandemic more broadly. God, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, my, a lot of my time that I've spent, you know, um, around the edges of academia have really been in science and technology studies where a lot of what I was interested in was taking data apart. <laughs> you know, a lot of what I was usually doing was being like, you see this data and these summary statistics that were generated by the government? Well, here's why they're, you know, and, um, <laughs> and there's a reason for that, you know, uh, here, um, here in Oakland, a lot of my work has been with a woman named Margaret Gordon, uh, who's an environmental justice activist. And so a lot of, how I interacted with her and came to understand her worldview and really and, and came to really believe in it was just that many of the statistics were designed to mislead people about uh, what was going on. You know, you put one air quality monitor in up high in the air and down, you know, away from where people actually live and all these things, and you can make the air quality in a place look a lot better than it actually is. Um, so what I, you know what is required is a sort of more honest data, I would say, you know, mm -hmm. um, and one thing, you know, that I think about our collective project is that, you know, it kind of does take that lesson of the environmental justice movement, which oftentimes was like, sure, there's this data, but we're also going to create our own over here. We're going to have our mm -hmm. own um, air monitors down here on the ground. We're going to make sure that we're not just counting on those statistics that are generated at the different levels of government, but that we're going to we're going to compare them to each other. We're going to play one governmental body against another to make sure that we can get a full picture. And I do, I mean, for me, my politics is really like, I think the environmental justice movement is really, really onto something. Um, yeah. I mean, this is an obvious and dumb thing to say, but it's actually at the very center of how I think things need to go. And one reason is that data gathering, getting data into the hands of people who can use it and advocates who understand yeah. the on the ground realities and can connect that to the way that people are actually living. Because if you had listened to people in neighborhoods all this time before data even existed, you would have known this is going to be a problem. If we'd listened to workers in meatpacking plants who were being told to go into work anyway, despite the fact that they knew that there was COVID in the community, like we would have done something about it, whether or not we had the, the data. And so I think for, for us and for the nation, I don't know how often data changes people's minds on its own, but there's something in the process of the data and the meaning when they, when they do align, um, it can be extremely powerful and more powerful than one or the other alone. No, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I, one of the things that I'm finding, particularly as I, as I, when I talk about um, racism um, and more specifically the way they operate through racial disparities, is you have people who can understand it at a narrative level and at a personal level. So they need, in order to really understand how racism is existing and how it's impacting people, they need to understand stories. And, and then you have other people who, who need to know the data. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it seems as if most people need both, right? Mm -hmm. They need the data and they need stories. And, and particularly if there's any chance of them understanding, but even certainly challenging their racial worldview. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it makes sense because data usually describes like systems. And so we need mm -hmm. data about these systems to change them. I think sure. the thing that, uh, you know, we don't know the real story about why the federal government has not released the data that we expected from them, which is what has made, uh, you know, our collective project and the COVID tracking project like uh, a necessity. Um, but I will say that if you don't collect data on something, it makes it easier to ignore the story part of it. Um, yeah. And I think if there's one thing that's really true, you know, particularly like as a student of 20th century history, that um, one of the main moves of governmental entities to uh, ig ignore, particularly like a, like a facet, really a true facet of like uh, Northern urban racism, and this is of course not news to you, is just like, um, don't record the numbers in that part of town, like this, this highly, or record the numbers in such a way that things that are done to a community are counted against the community, you know? Um, and so I, I think um, the, the nation's relationship to data and to racial data specifically um, probably needs like uh, its own independent examination as part of this COVID-19 yeah. uh, process um, because so many of these uh, structures were set up specifically to create invisibility in the places um, where uh, people did not want to deal with the like just and moral claims of, of black people and also a whole other bunch of uh, people of color. Yeah, without question, one of the one of the things that happens now is you, you have people who say things and we're saying even an early part of this pandemic, that this pandemic is the great equalizer. So it's, you know, it can infect and kill any racial group. And, and so, and every racial group is pretty much biologically the same. And so there's no reason to really have a racial lens. There's no reason to even categorize people uh, by race. But the, you know, and, and, and when it comes at a biological level, we shouldn't be characterizing by race. The, the only issue with that is you can absolutely say that at a biological level, we're all the same. We can all be infected um, and killed if, if we are in similar conditions, but a particular racial group is being infected um, and killed at higher rates. And, and how would we even know that if we're not collecting the, the and, and we're not presenting the, the, the racial demographic data. And in order to do that, people have to categorize the individual. And so, you know, what's fascinating is, I think you have some well-meaning people who think that the first step in creating an anti-racist America is us not categorizing by race. But in fact, that's possibly the last step because if we don't <laughs> categorize by race, we're not going to be able to see racial disparities. And, and if we can't see racial disparities, we're not going to be able to figure out, okay, what are the policies or lack thereof that are leading to those disparities? And then how can we basically challenge and eliminate those, those policies that are leading to those disparities? So we'll have all these disparities around us, the policies that are generating them, and we won't even be able to see those disparities or policies to, be, to even begin to change it all the while we're imagining the nation is, is sort of post-racial. Mm -hmm. um, when in fact our perspective is post-racial, not the nation. Yeah, gosh, that's a good, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting to think about um, the data that we, we are collecting, you know, our teams are collecting right now. Um, I think we should probably tell people a little bit about what we're, okay. what we're encountering. <laughs> Um, yes. Well, now that they've, you know, we wanted to frame it up, right? But, uh, but I think we should tell them a little about what we're, what we're encountering. Um, one of the things we, that's probably the first thing to say is that the data that is being collected is fairly low quality so far. Um, and that is a, we think, so for example, what that means um, in some states like Texas, if you want to know um, how many people of different ethnicities or races have been infected, 85% of that data is just not there. It, uh, when they ordered the test, um, it, no one put down a race or ethnicity. So that means for a state like Texas, we have like kind of like a small sample. Um, for other states, 
And Texas is a little state anyway, so it's not a big deal, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, a, a little not diverse state, right? I mean, it's yeah. just bonkers, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and we have encountered just a, a slew of problems like that. We've also in, encountered a lot of problems of standardizing between the way that states are reporting in different ways. Um, so some states are reporting basically like Hispanic, quote unquote Hispanic, as like its own kind of racial category. Um, some states are are doing that differently and more along the lines of the census having like racial categories and then ethnicity broken out. Um, I think there's one thing that we can pretty definitively say though, or really two things, um, and you you tell me if there's other things that um, that you think we should mention to people. But one is that um, there are just huge disparities in deaths among African Americans uh, relative to anybody else. Um, and two um, is that Native American people insofar as we're capturing them in the data because we're not actually totally sure how, how much of it were, how, how much of these uh, populations and these disparities we're capturing, um, are, are also experiencing really, really high rates uh, of death. Um, like in Arizona is one place we know we're seeing it with Navajo Nation, it's really a um, big problem. What else are you seeing? I think that's, um, I, I think that's certainly the case. And, and I mean, just so people can understand some of the some of the figures we've we've collected for the COVID racial data tracker, and when it comes to to, to African Americans in, in terms of known um, deaths uh, in Alabama, Black people are about twenty seven percent of the the population, but about forty six percent of the people of the known deaths in that state, and and that's pretty similar to Mississippi and South Carolina in Georgia. Actually, Georgia is a little bit worse. So Georgia, 32% Black people are of the population, but 53% um, of the people who, who've, who've been killed. And, and it also extends into the Midwest. And so in Illinois, Black people are 14 um, and a half or so percent of the population, but 30, about 35% you know, of the deaths. And, and you know, as you mentioned, in terms of the Native community, in, in Arizona, Native people are about 5% of the population, but 22% uh, of the people who, who have been killed. Yep, and you know, we, uh, you know, looking at these numbers, it's just stark. I mean, even if we, even if the data is imperfect, it's just, it's obvious and it's undeniable, I think that this is, this is what's happening. Um, I mean, I think there are some little wiggles in the data that are a little bit harder to explain, uh, particularly, you know, community I'm watching quite closely. <laughs> Latinx community, we uh, are, are, are testing we're, a lot of infections. Um, and in fact, there are three states that provide uh, testing information. And in all three, um, all the people they deem Hispanic in these ethnicity surveys are, are testing like their positive rates are like 60%, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. Like in Illinois, I think it's like, um, I mean, well, we got the, we got the numbers right here. Let's go to the tape. Oh, yeah, uh, I got it right here. Yeah, Illinois, Latinx people is about 17.4% of the population, but 32% positive yep. cases. No yeah, more. and and what's, what's crazy is it's basically more than every, uh, so, you know, for white people in Illinois, it's like 20%. If you go take a test, one out of every five white people who takes a test gets a positive. For the Latinx community, it's like, Every other person who gets a test gets a positive. And I think that speaks to a couple of different things. One is the sort of differential access to healthcare. Um, you have people who are not going in to get a test unless they are absolutely sick, you know? Um, I think it also probably um, speaks a little bit to the way that the, the undocumented community's relationship to the healthcare um, system. You know, Illinois has got a huge Mexican population and, um, you know, in some of these workplaces in particular that have been major sources. They, the, the, what's really the super spreading here isn't people, it's actually workplaces. It's, certain workplaces are the super spreaders. And um, a lot of those places have crowded, bad conditions where they keep lots of people in together. I mean, everything you would associate with a sweatshop and that kind of work, um, is, it's, it's the opposite of social distancing and it's why a lot of people are getting sick. Um, and so I think one of the other things that's happening is it's spreading through these workplaces, um, just in the way that it's spreading through long-term care facilities, or you know, another thing that we're both pretty concerned about, which are like the prisons and jails in this in this country. 
you want to talk a little yeah. bit about that too? Like what we're seeing on, on prisons and in jails? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, well, first of all, I mean, black and, black and Latinx people make up about, last I checked, about two thirds um, of the incarcerated population, which is about double their um, national population. And I mean, you know, I think the first major prison in which people started seeing um, a large outbreak was in Rikers, um, you know, Rikers Island. And, and so those cases and, 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 and so, yeah, all over the country, we're, we're seeing, you know, prisons and actually one of my early essays um, called what, what the racial data show, I, I not only wanted to talk about the, the disparities that we knew at the time, um, but, but also to think through the places where, or the communities in which there's potential for a large um, spread. And, and so I talked about the undocumented uh, immigrants. I, I talked about incarcerated people. I talked about the homeless population, which of course is a major issue mm -hmm. in, in California. And then I also talked about the, um, as and we're seeing this now, you know, people who live in, in senior citizen um, homes and assisted living facilities. And, and so when we're thinking about even that population of people who are living in those in nursing homes and assisted, we're actually talking about an overwhelmingly white population. And so I think in the, in the piece, something about three and four people who are in assisted living and nursing homes are white and, 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 and they're being slammed. Um, and, and I actually suggested that uh, for white Americans, that may be the most difficult place to be right now. So no other place are the disparities so massive for white people, mm -hmm. uh, seemingly as they are in, in assisted living facilities. Yeah. You know, I mean, just on the on the prison score, I mean, the, the numbers that have been coming back on that from individual prisons are just absolutely yeah. mind blowing. Like uh, one prison in Ohio, uh, with, you know, several, several thousand uh, people, um, had 80% of the people tested positive. Um, which I think says a few things, if you really think about what that means, that it, it means A, that the thing had been spreading, that people had been getting sick and they'd been getting ignored, which gave it time to spread through the rest of the population. It also tells you a lot about the cleaning standards and overcrowding and a lot of the other ways that, uh, that those kinds of institutions treat the people that, that are inside them. Um, yeah, I, and, if, and if, the, if, the, if they are being in, in infected, then chances are the the, the guards are being infected and chances are they're coming home to their families and, and, and being infected and spreading it. I mean, and so this is, I mean, and you know, another group we haven't spoken about is the Asian American uh, community and, and in particular in Alaska, uh, uh, the Asian population is about six and a half percent, but their, their, their uh, positive case rate is double that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's also doubling in, in, in Tennessee, um, mm -hmm. even the native Hawaiian population in, in certain places are, are you know, faced with a pretty sizable disparity. So we're seeing this really all over. And I think what's mm -hmm. critical about our data, the COVID racial data trackers, is people can see, okay, what racial group in what state is, is really being impacted. And, and you know, with the hope that, that the advocates in that state can really lean on this particularly you know, vulnerable population. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, um, there's there's something that people always bring up in the context of, um, you know, racial disparities are like, uh, well, isn't it really just about class? <laughs> you know, people want to bring, you know, is it is it about you know socioeconomic status? And um, what do you what do you say about that? It's an audience question already. I saw it on the sheet, so we're yeah. we're answering it early, but. So I think when we think about deaths and, and infection and the causes of the, the reasons why um, certain groups are being infected or even killed, I mean, it's, it's a similar conversation, but then there's sometimes some mass differences. So for instance, on the infection side, if we think through um, why is it that certain communities have higher levels of infection, I think it's not difficult for people to see that if you have a an extremely densely populated 
area, neighborhood. Um, you know, I grew up in, in Jamaica, Queens, and there was this uh, place called 40P, 40 high-rise projects of, of public housing projects in a massively densely populated area. And, and, and so people can understand how and why this virus can spread rapidly in that type of neighborhood and, and potentially not in a more suburban neighborhood where there's less people. And so then when we start thinking about uh, uh, those more densely populated areas, we're also thinking about neighborhoods that are more likely to be poor. Um, and then when we start thinking about the relationship between, let's say, Black poverty or white poverty, we actually know that they actually are quite different in the United States. And, and particularly, Black poor people are much more likely to live in high poverty neighborhoods than white poor people. Mm -hmm. To give an example, in Chicago, if you're poor and Black, you're 10 times more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood than a white poor person. And again, that high poverty neighborhood is usually, particularly if it's an urban neighborhood, more likely to be densely populated. And so then the question becomes, why? Why is it that Black people are, are more likely, Black poor people are more likely to live in these densely populated neighborhoods than white people? Then we start thinking about things like redlining, right? Yeah. You know, then we start thinking about housing discrimination. Then we, and, and so then we can start recognizing the history and the presence of racist policies that have more or less segregated these poor Black and even Latinx and Native communities in these densely populated areas that then lead to these higher levels of infection. And then you combine that with their having less likely to have access to high quality health care, then you can see how they're also dying at higher rates. Yep, yep, yep. And I think, you know, some of the very things um, that have led, particularly say in the Bay Area here, to this kind of bifurcated economy where you have like uh, a bunch of largely white uh, and Asian people who are able to work from home for companies yeah. through their computer tech work. And then you have black and Latinx communities over here who are primarily not doing that kind of work. Um, and as a result, like they need to go in, you know, they, they, need, yeah. they need to go do stuff or they're also, you know, the other big thing is, you know, everybody's talking about, um, you know, closing down and, uh, you know, the, the, the economic impact that it's had on like, you know, small business owners and stuff. But, you know, the entire kind of like nanny, you know, gardener service provider in the, in the sort of like Latin world, all those people have been wiped out by this as uh, white families shelter in place, get their family time and decide they need like less household help. Um, and, you know, most of those deals are not on the books. Most of those people just don't, they just don't get any money anymore and they can't go uh, apply for unemployment insurance because they haven't been on the books for 10 years, you know? And there's all these different ways in which people then, uh, someone like that is then forced back out into the, uh, the working world or out into the world to try and find work and, and do other kinds of things. And I, I think, um, yeah, both like the structural aspects that you were talking about and also just like the little, the way that that, you know, is, is playing out in COVID-19 is kind of exactly what you would expect. Like, I don't think there's really been yeah. very much surprising about that. The only little wrinkle in the data that maybe is, is a little different, and there's, there's hints of this in the other, um, uh, the other health literature as well, is that even though the Latin community is getting hit pretty hard infection-wise, death rates are actually quite low. Um, and one thing we'd really like to be able to answer, but we don't have the data to answer, is, it's be, is that because of the sort of age structure of those populations? So if we know that um, you know, those communities are substantially younger than, um, than other uh, racial or ethnic groups in that area, then we'd be able to say, okay, that's probably what it is. Um, and it's, it's, it's really quite interesting though, because it's one of the wrinkles in the data where that you, you only really see it there. Um, and, uh, and it's something I'd love to be able to answer with our data at some point when we're able to do these other kinds of intersectional analysis around um, you know, age and gender and race all sort of you know, um, crossed with each other. Yeah, and you know, another thing about class I wanted to mention very quickly, right? class and neighborhood. Sure. I think what studies also show is that middle income black people are far and away more likely to live near poor people 
um, that's who are usually black than middle income white people. And, and so, and, and that, what that then means is, is let's say if, if the um, poor neighborhood, the poor black neighborhoods are more likely to be polluted. Um, and, and then middle income black people are more likely to live near those neighborhoods than let's say white people, then that can then impact um, their health outcomes. Um, and then the other side, I think that's absolutely critical is, you know, it, 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 studies consistently show that, that let's say black people receive inferior care from the mm -hmm. same hospitals and the same doctors. Yep. And that no matter their race or class. And I think that's probably been most striking in recent years as people have witnessed the disparities in, in um, one, um, the racial disparities among pregnant um, mothers. Um, and so you have wealthy black women who are dying at higher rates mm -hmm. um, when they're giving birth than poor white women. Um, you have wealthy women like Serena Williams who are not being listened to by their doctors when, when, what, when poor white women are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have uh, some questions, which I'm okay. going to get to. Yes. The first one is, um, uh, where is there sort of existing, where can people go for um, the existing data and evidence about uh, health disparities? And I'm going to give a local answer and then you can think of like a good national one. Locally, I think if you, if you really want a good read into this, uh, Tony Eitan, the guy that I mentioned earlier, um, when he was um, the head of Alameda County Public Health, they generated a report called Life and Death from Unnatural Causes, Health and Social Inequity in Alameda County. And it is, uh, this is a dynamite report. I mean, it's, it's like, you, you would never really say this, but this thing is a banger. Like if you wanna read a really good report about why it is that racial disparities exist um, they, and you want it broken down um, and you want it to be local to you. And uh, th if you're here in the Bay, that go to unnatural causes. It's, it's truly, uh, uh, it, it, if you need to change someone's opinion, that is a good report <laughs> to go with. And then the, the CDC um, has a health equity division that, that sometimes release health disparity reports. So that could be a place to, to see it at a more national level. Mm -hmm. Cool, let's see. Let me get this next. Uh, um, Elena, I'm just gonna tell you, you have a very detailed question about Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. If you wanna email me, at alexis at the atlantic.com i will make sure we get that answered for you because it is an extremely good question but too detailed to do on, on camera here um here's a question uh you from um how can we convince corporate management like those at meat packing plants that it's in their best interest to safeguard the health of their workers rather than force them to work in unsafe conditions <laughs> well i i, I my my first thought is to dem demonstrate it using data and, and to really, really show them how it's in their economic interest um, to, to protect these workers because the cost of not protecting them is greater um, than, um, than essentially what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, how that data would look, what, what it would say obviously is is not necessarily something that I know, but but I do know that corporate managers, as everyone knows, I mean, if something makes um, sense, meaning C E N T S, uh, then they're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if you look at those meat packing plants, and you could go back in time and say, "Are you sure you don't want to shut down a little bit just so that you don't have the hugest outbreaks in the country, and therefore have everyone?" looking at the business practices of JBS and Smithfield and Tyson and all those things. Um, I think that's a big one. And I, you know, the other big one is th this is, um, you know, this is not a principled answer. This is a, how do we protect these people answer? And the answer that I would give is you get the cost of a test down that's low as you possibly can. You can get that cost of the test down. You can test people every single day 
then you have a better chance of protecting people and saving lives at these meatpacking plants. And like, there's a bunch of different ways that that could be done. I think the most promising one right now um, are uh, this kind of like grouped or pooled assays. Basically, you you take a bunch of workers um, or, or people, anybody, and you actually swab all of them and then combine them into one thing. Uh, and you're able to then, if you have a group of low lower risk workers, you use sort of like less tests um, per sort of infection that you catch. And it's sort of a, it was a, a technique that was actually pioneered um, uh, in sort of HIV um, outbreak prevention. But a um, bunch of people that I've been talking to think that this is actually something that's going to be extremely useful in terms of using less testing materials, which are limited and, and will be more limited by supply chain stuff as we scale up, um, and, uh, and making the cost for testing people go, go down. I mean, I wish they would just do it because that's what they should do. <laughs> but but you, just in dealing, reckoning with the reality of, you know, your average meatpacking plant um, or, or corporation, you know, that's, that's also going to be part of that solution. Um, it's a good one, um, uh, Ibram. Uh, to the extent to which research demonstrates bias in medicine also leads to disparate mortality rates for Black, Indigenous, people of color. What are the current efforts to reduce the impact of bias during the pandemic? For example, patient advocates in emergency rooms, anti-bias primers uh, before healthcare workers shifts, et cetera. Well, I think, well, I know with the, with our COVID racial data tracker, we're, we're trying to, to build a network of, of local advocates who could propose precisely some of those great uh, interventions that you just described. Because I don't, I don't think, for instance, a lot of people, of course, have talked about the role that comorbidities play in, in Black people dying at higher rates. And I sus certainly that's part of it. But I suspect that another part of it is precisely this, the medical racism um, that, is, that is persisting. And, and you know, my wife is, a, is an ER uh, physician, pediatric ER doc. And you know, one of the things she, she tells me is that when you, first of all, when you are an ER doc and you have a massive patient load, you're, you're more likely, not only, you know, I think this isn't really about make mistakes, but you're, you're more likely to lean on biases in order to make quick decisions. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you're overloaded because you've worked 30 hours, you're also more likely to lean on racist ideas um, because you're not fully functioning. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think part of this isn't just, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, that, that, these, that these medical providers are not acting on their racist ideas. The other part of it is, as we've all been advocating for ensuring that medical providers are not being overloaded, because that's when they're more likely to do these types of things. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some COVID specific things that are very difficult in this, right? People are dealing with a bunch of situations they haven't encountered before. They're dealing with them in high volume and, um, and there aren't great standards of care yet, it seems like, or at least the standards of care are in flux. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think in particular, you know, a lot of this stuff around, well, you can't be admitted into the hospital unless you have this kind of blood oxygen level, but then discovering that actually maybe there were other things going on. I mean, one of the stories that, uh, you know, I've heard here um, in the Mexican community is uh, sort of a, a, a woman who got turned away many times, told just to just go home, you know, just go, went into the uh, hospital, they were just like, no, 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 yeah, you're fine. You, you may have this, but sorry, no, we're not going to admit you here, whatever, whatever, whatever. And just like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She was like, I feel like I'm going to die here and you're sending me home. Like, what is going on here? Um, goes to a different hospital. In this case, it was UCSF. Um, and they it admitted her instantly and were like, of course, you need really serious medical care here. And the, just the, wow. the basic fact that the same person in the same day with the same presentation at one place would have care like this and at the other place would have care like that. I mean, kudos to UCSF for doing this, but just the very fact of that variability um, strikes me as uh, just, a, just a huge problem. And for exactly the reason that in these times of uncertainty, what do, where do people go? They, recent, they reach into the racist handbag and, and instead of putting it into a more analytical framework that might allow them mm -hmm. to check their biases. So Precisely. it's tough. Um, let's take a couple more of these questions here. Um, 
Um, no, this is interesting. Well, you know, um, uh, there's a lot of questions. This is a good group because what they want to know from us is what do we do to change these to the disparities? You know, a couple of different people. The causes are familiar, so what can we do about it? You know, where do we go from here to change the disparities? So, so I think I think that there's really two answers to this. There's the short-term um, answers of what we literally can can potentially do during the pandemic and then what we should think about sort of long term. And so when we're thinking long term, we're, we're thinking about some of those structural conditions like that I that we've mentioned earlier, like the density um, you know, of public housing or the uh, closeness to or the people being forced to live in polluted areas. Those are obviously not things we can we can change overnight. But what we can do is say, you know, this particular racial group in this state or in this county is being infected or killed at a higher rate than any other racial group. And we can figure out ways to ensure that every single member of that racial group knows we can try to figure out why that is the case. And we can make interventions in real time. We, we, we can and, and so there, I think that's what we should be thinking about. And that's how we can then use the data um, to, to make those, those interventions. We, of course, should be ensuring that, that the same, that, that those communities that are overloaded with patients, um, who specifically seriously ill patients, that, they're, that the hospitals are not turning those people away. I'm, I'm just personally, very quickly, very concerned about Southwest Georgia, which has one of the highest um, per capita death rates in the country. And a lot of them are around these five counties around Albany, Georgia, and my wife's um, family is, is from there. And the availability of doctors there hardly compares to the availability of doctors in New York City, which also has a massive outcome. And, and so mm -hmm. what are the ways in which we can bring more healthcare resources to these specific places with the largest outbreaks, particularly that have racial disparities as well? That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing you can do, um, we have, if you go to covidtracking.com slash race, um, you will see that there's a, a place that show that tracks how states are, are reporting these things. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, a lot of states are doing a lot better. Um, like that is to say, what we really want from them is to be, uh, you know, reporting the racial and ethnic breakdowns of cases, of deaths, and of, and of testing. Um, and you can see that very um, few states are reporting nothing now, but also many are not reporting uh, completely um, either. Yeah. And so if you want to get in contact with people from those, <laughs> from those states, yes. you know a governor, you know somebody who, you know, in a public health department who can help shake that data free, um, we would love you to do that. Um, I mean, there is one thing we found is, you know, um, a wonderful man on Ibram's team basically shook down the state of Maine um, in order to get the <laughs> racial data out of them. Um, and, and they, they agreed to do it and then they did it. Um, and it's, it's actually surprising how much, um, traction we've been able to get in getting states to release more data. Um, in part, because I think maybe they think that if they do it in response to a place called the anti-research policy and research center, um, <laughs> research and policy center, sorry, then they, they it's sort of unassailable. They're like, hey, listen, the ARPC asked us to do it, and so now we put it out. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who initially didn't really want this data to be, to be released. Um, and one yeah. thing that I've always found curious is most of the opposition that we've encountered for releasing this kind of data comes from people who in all other ways want all the data released. Um, and that says to me, maybe there's some other ideological thing that's going on there, you know, yeah. aside from, you know, just an interest in, in you know, uh, in data. Uh, <laughs> um, let me see if there's one, one last question. If not, I, um, nope, we're good. I think we um, should go. There is one last thing to do though. Um, at the end of these, um, they like to have us say the 60 second answer to the thing they would do to change the world. 
Oh man. <laughs> you have several I, I think, books worth of ideas here. I feel like <laughs> yeah. I, I think for me, it would be two things. That first, that everyone, when they see a racial disparity, they don't see what's wrong with a particular racial group. They try to figure out what policies could be causing those disparities and those policies that are leading to those disparities are classified as racist. And, and so instead of us currently having this breakdown in which you need racial language in the, dis, in the policy or you need some sort of smoking gun of intent, very simply, if a policy is leading to racial inequity or even injustice, it is racist. If it is leading to equity and justice, it is anti-racist. And, 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 and when we see disparities and inequities, we're seeing racism. If, if, it was, if we were able to simplify it to that, I think we could uh, transform uh, uh, this country. I'll give, you, I'll give you mine, which is not, not unrelated, which is, you know, we talk a lot in this country about um, equality and it gets caught up in a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to say everyone should have the same amount of money. People don't want to say um, all, all kinds of stuff that, that's difficult to get consensus around, consensus around equality. But there's one thing that just, you, it, it's absolutely irrefutable and it should be uh, the top public goal. It's that everyone should have the same life expectancy. Like at the end of the day, no one should be having years shaved off their life by, by systemic racism, just period. There, there's, there's, I don't show me a person in this world who thinks that that's not a worthy goal. And the thing is, if we set that as the goal, most of the other things that we talk about underneath there are gonna align with that. Because we know if you've got a lot of money, you're gonna live for longer. You know, If you've got access to outdoor space, you're gonna live for longer. If you've got access to better healthcare, you're gonna live for longer. If you, you know, all these, if you got access to, to better and, and more education, you're going to live for longer. And those things, we need to take that on is in like, you know, we're shaving years off people's lives by doing nothing about these disparities. And at the end of the day, like that is the goal. I mean, life should be the goal. Um, and, and I think most of the other policy things that I would like to see accomplished in my lifetime would line up really neatly underneath it. Um, I think that is all the time we have. It is 401 on the dot. Um, thank you uh, for joining us, Dr. Kendi. Um, yes, thank you, Alexis. And, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club and Inforum um, for, for having us here to talk about our project. Thank you so much and have a, a great rest of your afternoon.